Good evening. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, we are here reconvening after the executive session of the school committee uh, for the Thursday, January 2nd, 2020 meeting. And I request all those present and willing to please join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First up on the agenda of recognitions. So we have some special guests tonight, Tiffany uh, Ransaran, Shazane Khan, and Joe Wang. So if you want to come up and have a seat next to the microphone, please. Do we need another chair? <laughs> no. Just, is Joe here? I don't think so. Do we not have Joe with us tonight? No, Joe. Hello. Hi. Hi. So <laughs> I've invited Shazane and Tiffany here tonight uh, because they are two of the three students who served on our calendar subcommittee. And so tonight we are presenting the calendar. Shazane is still working to... Um, try to formulate something for the online piece so that when we have page two of the calendar and every holiday is listed, you'll just be able to click on a holiday and learn something more about it. Uh, the calendar subcommittee was divided into sort of smaller working groups, uh, and that was the group that Shazane was on. But I do want to thank both of you so much because as students, you brought a lens to that group that you know a lot of the adults in the room would never have had, and you were real troopers. You showed up all the time, and those meetings were sometimes long and arduous. Um, and you also contributed markedly, I think, in the information that you brought to us. So it really warranted you coming tonight and, and just being thanked by, by me and by the committee. Mrs. Parson, who was the co-chair. Do you want to tell about your Thank experience? You. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> great. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Oh, well, I think it was a great experience, and I learned a lot that I actually used to apply as I'm serving on, like, board of directors for BPA, and I'm like, oh, we did this in the committee meeting, and now I can use all of that knowledge and move it forward going on into life, too. That's crazy. Yeah. I was surprised by the sheer diversity of different people that live in Hopkinton right now, and so trying to find different cultural observances and religious holidays that would... Um, fit with the different beliefs of our community. It was challenging, but it was also very educational. So I felt like I learned a lot through that experience. Well, thank you both. Thank what you. was one thing um, that you, you talked about, for, uh, the educational aspect of it? What was something new that you learned being part of the subcommittee, Shazane? Um, well, the first thing that comes to my mind was that initially, uh, I'm a Muslim, so I thought Diwali, which is a Hindu celebration um, was uniformly celebrated throughout India with the same purpose and the same uh, understanding of the holiday as the conquest of light versus darkness. Um, but someone informed me at one of the meetings that um, in the South, it's not as, it's not seen in the same light and it has a different historical context. And that um, inspired me to try to look for the different nuances within each uh, cultural observance in order to make sure that every person and every person's beliefs were appropriately represented. Yeah, no, India is certainly diverse, and uh, it's a little Europe, if you will, with different cultures for every state and every language. It's different languages, different cuisines. That's great. How about you, Tiffany? What oh. did you think was educational? <laughs> what was that process like? Were there challenges in the process when everybody got together and perhaps had different ideas at times? Um, I think one of the most amazing things that Part of being part of this committee was just like hearing the different opinions because like a lot of people brought up stuff that I never would have thought about and I really like understand the importance of having a committee especially when I hear like oh a teacher has this perspective a parent would have this perspective and like coming together and like seeing and making it all work is like really powerful and impactful in my opinion. That's great. And that's why it was so important that you were both there, because they needed yeah. the student perspective. And to get that student perspective, and from somebody who's as thoughtful as you both obviously are, if you're thinking about sort of the differences and nuances of, of any given holiday, that's, I mean, that's huge. So uh, you guys, that's fantastic that you volunteered and stepped up to do this. Yeah. And you may rem remember them from our second diversity forum. They both spoke there. Yeah. Yes. Are you both seniors? Yes. Yes. 
so probably a busy fall for you <laughs> anyway already. It's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> and you still went to every committee still, meeting. Yeah, I know. Uh -huh. That's huge. They're very good. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you very so much. much. Thank good you for lending your voice to the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next item on the agenda, public comments. Do we have a, no, we're not, okay, no, we're good. Is that the tenure? No, we're good. Oh, oh, sorry, just give us one moment, please. Are there any other recognitions? But that's what I thought there was, but there aren't. It's, okay, there the I didn't know people. if you had nope, a shout nope, out I just, anyone. I had a moment sorry. there, but my, my bad. <laughs> sorry, please do come up. Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Hi, thank you. If you wouldn't mind, start by uh, stating your name and the reason you're here. And okay. Uh, my name is Becky Abate, and I am the president of the Hopkinton Teachers Association, um, and I prepared a statement to share with you all tonight. Over the last several weeks, several weeks, we have heard so much about the unprecedented, unprecedented growth in the Hopkinton Public Schools and the plans to expand our physical buildings. We've also heard from principals at each of our schools who have come here to share their budget proposals for the 2020-21 school year. These budgets and presentations are all meant to address the growing populations at our schools, and though they do a good job of presenting an idea of what our schools, teachers, and students need based on numbers of enrollment, looking at the number of students we have now and will have next year doesn't truly paint a picture of what is happening at our schools or what teachers are able to provide to our students. I am here tonight to speak on behalf of the Hopkinton Teachers Association and hopefully give you what we feel is a more accurate depiction of our needs and the concerns of the Hopkinton teachers as we try to maintain the excellence of Hopkinton schools in the face of what we believe are very real threats to the quality of education for our students. I'd like to begin with Marathon, as this is the entryway for students into our school system. The teachers in both the pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade have different challenges than any others in the district. The children they teach are unknown entities, as they are brand new, not just to the district, but to schooling in general. These teachers are tasked with not only edifying their students with the foundations of learning, but also with identifying the diverse educational and social emotional needs of the kids in front of them so they can lay the best pathway for what is ahead. I hesitate to talk about class size because again, it's not just about the numbers of students, it's about their needs, but I must admit that it is alarming to hear that there are frequently 23 and 24 students in our lower elementary classrooms. What is important to know about these students is that teachers are seeing an influx of students in first grade who require reading services and yet who don't have access to such remediation because of the staggering drop in staffing of both reading specialists and paraprofessionals. In years past, first grade had three reading teachers and three to four paraprofessionals. These positions either no longer exist or have been reduced significantly. Also, in years past, the guidance counselors have been able to teach social skills to each class. Library specialists were able to meet with small groups for enrichment lessons. Today, Marathon has a part-time reading specialist for kindergarten and just one reading support teacher for first grade. No enrichment support and seven A-level paraprofessionals to serve 13 classes across kindergarten and two a-level paraprofessionals to serve 12 first grade classes. Teachers rely on our paraprofessionals to help address student safety needs, which allows classroom teachers to provide more effective instruction, including the chance to provide RTI, response to intervention, which addresses the individualized developmental needs of our youngest students. Additionally, teachers are asked to take on the duty of teaching social skills because the guidance staff can no longer find time in their day to do this vital work due to other behavioral needs. Without enough pairs and counselors, teachers are stretched in a way that does not benefit our students, and they are seeing the impact of reduced support reveal itself in student behaviors. It is Marathon's hope that they can work to put out fires and identify needs before these students leave them for Elmwood and Hopkins, 
Marathon teachers want you to know that their concerns are not about the number of students, but about the needs of students. Marathon teachers, counselors, and specialists don't want to provide anything less than excellence for the students of Hopkinton, but have real concerns that this is and will continue to be the case without adequate staffing. The experience at Elmwood, the next stop on our students' path, is similar. Overwhelmingly, teachers are seeing an uptick in the diverse learning needs as well as in the social emotional needs of their students. One teacher I spoke to told me about the challenges of trying to do small group work in a classroom where so many cannot be left to work independently. Instead, this teacher relies on whole group lessons so that behaviors can be better addressed, but where individual learning and developmental needs are not. Teachers in Elmwood feel the stress of needing to not only teach curriculum, but to serve as data collectors, social workers, and counselors as well. No teacher would ever suggest that our job is to only teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. We are here to teach the whole child. However, there reaches a tipping point when the social emotional needs are so high that the focus on academics is hindered, especially when outside supports are also stretched or diminished. Elmwood used to have two full-time reading specialists. One of those specialists retired a few years ago and was never replaced, leaving the remaining specialists with an increased teaching load and many students who have literacy needs that they are not being met. This year, there are 75 students in second grade who are reading below grade level, and Elmwood has one reading specialist. Similarly, learning specialists are stretched across multiple classrooms and often find themselves managing social emotional crisis situations instead of attending to the learning needs of their students. Other support specialists have seen caseloads increase by over 30 percent. Elmwood, te Elmwood teachers want you to know that their concerns are not about the number of students but about the needs of their students. Elmwood teachers, counselors, and specialists don't want to provide anything less than excellence for the students of Hopkinton but have real concerns that this is and will continue to be the case without adequate staffing. Now on to Hopkins where space is at a premium and class sizes are pushing to 25 students. While class size and increasing enrollment are being addressed with the addition of modulars and additional classroom teachers, Hopkins teachers worry about meeting the challenging needs of these students. There is an increasing number of students not on IEPs or 504s, but who have similar needs for academic, behavioral, or emotional support. These needs and the human resources they require won't be taken into account in the data used for planning, but their needs exist and are real. Guidance counselors charged with prioritizing students with counseling needs and education plans are frequently not available to those who don't have the same documented requirement. Serving the social emotional needs of our students should never be a luxury given to only those who legally require it, but should be available to all students who need it to be happy, healthy children who are ready to learn and develop. In regards to the academic impacts of needing to service more students on educational plans, the preferred and effective model of having learning specialists co-teach with classroom teachers has been pushed to the wayside due to the need for learning specialists to double their caseloads. Space for small group work with these students is at a premium, taxing not just teachers, but cramping also the quality of the academic experience they are able to provide. Hopkins teachers want you to know that their concerns are not about the number of students, but about the needs of students. Hopkins teachers, counselors, and specialists don't want to provide anything less than excellence for the students of Hopkinton, but have real concerns that this is and will continue to be the case without adequate staffing. I'd now like to paint a picture of how the middle school has been impacted by the district's decision to approach staffing at this school on a year-to-year -year basis, dependent upon slight shifts in enrollment. For the last several years, we have seen teachers leave and not be replaced as an opportunity for the district to reallocate funds elsewhere. Though it appears that the middle school is up four teachers in the last three years, when looking closer at these new positions, we see that they are actually just restoring positions which had been prematurely reduced. And then in the last weeks ahead of the 2018 school year, filled. This year, we lost two core academic teachers whose positions were not filled. And next year, we will continue to be down one in history. 
This has had a deleterious effect on the tried and true team teaching model that HMS and countless other high performing middle schools utilize. This concept of team teaching allows for students transitioning out of elementary school and preparing for high school in the midst of the chaos of early adolescence to best have their academic and social emotional needs met. The middle school has been asked many times in the last few years to cut teaching positions because they can't be justified by the class sizes of a particular grade. It's dangerous to look at staffing in a middle school based on basic class size calculations because they are often inaccurate due to the scheduling realities of having leveled math classes and other student schedule needs. One class may have 12 students while another may have 26. More so, it's dangerous because when you take apart a teaching team or combine two broken teams, which has been the case for the past two years and will continue into next year, you break down the value of that team teaching model. We lose the shared perspective of those teachers who have shared eyes on a student and whose insights when combined can recognize strengths or weaknesses in a child's academic or social and emotional scope. When you try to maintain three full teams in a grade but need to do so without, for example, a history teacher on one of those teams, as will be the case next year, well, it's not really a team. Now you have kids going off team for math, foreign language, as well as history, and you've splintered the focus of those teachers with shared eyes on those students. Now you have teachers teaching out of their license area, whether it's a math teacher teaching science, as was the case this year and last, or an English teacher teaching a brand new history curriculum. You've sacrificed quality of instruction across the board. Breaking the team model diminishes the work of PLCs of our professional learning communities. It diminishes the work of the department and diminishes the excellence that HMS and all of our Hopkinton schools strive towards. Similarly, next year, despite having 100 additional students, HMS will lose a moderate learning specialist and face a reduction to a program in place to support what all schools are experiencing, a rise in student anxiety, stress, and other social emotional conflicts. Again, you can rely just on numbers and say that the caseloads of the learning specialists are still less than in other districts, but you won't see that middle school learning specialists are also teaching multiple support classes that could be taught by reading or math specialists or intensive teachers if we had the proper staffing. HMS learning specialists are stretched thin and though they strive to maintain the quality of services, there will be a tipping point. Similarly, related arts teachers have seen their student caseload increase by 41% with zero staffing growth. Their tipping point is coming too. Middle school teachers want you to know that their concerns are not about the number of students but about the needs of students. HMS teachers, counselors, and specialists don't want to provide anything less than the excellence for students of Hopkinton, but have real concerns that this is and will continue to be the case without adequate staffing. Last stop is our high school, which is the most cited of our schools when it comes to accolades and rankings and any other kind of data which puts Hopkinton at the top of Massachusetts public schools. Like the middle school, the high school is a place where basic class size calculations based on enrollment don't tell the story of the experience for students and teachers. HHS prides itself on offering a rich selection of courses that allow students to follow their passions and find their best fit whether they need to be enriched, supported, or somewhere in between. Doing this, however, means that class sizes are oftentimes skewed. Science and history courses, for example, this year have class sizes upwards of 28 and 30 students with caseloads as high as 147, which is not dissimilar from math and English. These caseloads are staggering, especially for teachers who place such a high standard on their planning, grading, and teaching and want to give nothing short of excellence to their students. Tonight, I have spoken about the social and emotional needs of students at each school, and the high school is no different. Because of staffing sh shortages and the high need for our START program, which is our Student Therapeutic Academic Resource Team program, and the services it delivers, the high school program is currently turning away students who are not only eligible, but are in desperate need for what START provides. 
Next year's budget will not allow for a social emotional learning director, which would have helped to alleviate and even prevent some of the mental health challenges of Hopkinton High School students. Teachers remark on how they have never seen students exhibit such heartbreaking symptoms of anxiety and depression. Teachers here and across the district are seeing are feeling similar levels of increased stress and note the impact on their own work-life balance and mental health. Hopkinton High School teachers want you to know that their concerns also are not about the number of students, but about the needs of students. High school teachers, counselors, and specialists don't want to provide anything less than excellence for the students of Hopkinton, but have real concerns that this is and will continue to be the case without adequate staffing. The last thing to talk about is an issue each and every one of our schools is dealing with, and that is meeting the needs of our grow it, growing English learner population, a task which compounds the other challenges I've already discussed. Our English learner teaching staff is stretched so thin, some with caseloads as many as 40 students. English learner teachers have no time in their schedules to meet with content area or classroom teachers to provide support to them as they work with the very individualized needs of our English learner population. They aren't able to attend IEP meetings for English, for English learners also receiving special education services. To address staffing concerns, we have English learner teachers spread across multiple buildings and we have non-licensed tutors working with these students. All of this results in students not meeting language goals and only adds to the stress all teachers feel. I appreciate your time tonight. I hope that I have been able to shed light on the situation in our schools from those who are on the front lines. I hope I was able to help you see behind the class size numbers and realize that it takes more than passionate, dedicated teachers to make this district excellent. It takes a budget that will provide us with the staffing we need to do right by our students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bate. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you. Is there anyone else here for public comment? Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda reports, student council. some updates for us? Uh, yeah, I'm Henry Edwards. I'm Lucas Nealon. I'm Kaden Boyce. Uh, yeah, so we're all on student council and uh, we're just gonna update you guys a little bit on what's going on at the high school. Uh, as you guys know, short week, two days this week. Uh, after our vacation, our vacation was homework free this year. I'm happy with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, I, I really do think it was a good break for everyone. My classmates, I think we got just a little time off from everything and came come back for the for the two days and get those done and look on to 2020 um yeah and along with that we have exam week coming up uh starting the week of january 20th um after martin luther king um holiday so uh the way we structure the final or midterms here at the high school is we have two per day um which creates like a half day for students and then we get dismissed and I know all of us go home and study for the upcoming final or midterms. Sorry, that we have. Um, I'll give it over. Okay. <laughs> so um, on the twentieth, December twentieth, which was the Friday before vacation, we hosted Ugly Sweater Day at our school, and it was a way to raise school spirit. And a lot of teachers and students got into it, and we picked a winner, getting a twenty dollars Chipotle gift card. So I, that like hyped up the want to have the best sweater. And then the following day, student council, about 30 of us took the train into Boston and helped Christmas in the City prepare for their event that following Sunday. So most of us wrapped empty boxes, cut out um, snowflakes out of tissue paper, and made place placemats for those people. And then we took the train back in, which I think was great, because we did something helping Boston and didn't spend our first day vacation like relaxing or whatever. We put that time forward and did something better and it was just fun because it was a break from school but you got to still hang out with people in student council and then the second thing 
is Hiller Days that we started doing this year every single Friday, and the last one being uh, Extra Help Hiller Day, which I think is good because usually not a lot of teachers can stay after, and it's harder for kids to stay after, especially if they don't have cars and take the bus. So this way they can take the bus to school, be here for an extra hour before school, and get that extra help. The only downside to that is that if you're staying for extra help on that last Friday, but there's like you have a test earlier that month, then you can't stay for extra help that day. So if we had like another way to fix extra help earlier on in the morning, then that would work. And yeah, otherwise they're good because we get to sleep in some days. We don't need else to do. Um, so International Night is where we focus um, on all the international students and they present things that are special about like their country and where they come from and they um, usually make food that's like different from each country and all are welcome so you can all come it's um, Thursday the 30th and there's going to be food and music and the foreign language teachers also sometimes come and they have their classes like um, visit depending on if it, it's French or Mandarin or Spanish. Um, and then the last thing is the challenge success um, meeting team. So almost our whole school took a challenge success survey, basically asking us like about our stress levels and how we think we're doing in school and like the last time we think we've cheated and like um, the results are in now. So people are going to be analyzing that, and um, that'll be Thursday the tenth and. Um, Mr. Bishop was telling us how interesting the results were, especially for cheating, just because of the overload of um, teachers giving us homework that may not be um, super beneficial towards us. So people copy answers because they think they understand it and they don't think it's worth their time. So that's causing a problem. So um, that's what the Challenge Success Meeting Team is for. That's everything we have for you guys. That's great, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Just two days after break. Yes. <laughs> right, any other thoughts? No, thank you. Great, no, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your one more day of school. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Next item on the agenda, technology budget update. Mr. Ghosh. I have a... Mr. Ghosh, just yes. before you start, please. Uh, Mr. Manning from the Appropriations Committee is here. Good evening, Mr. Manning. I was wondering if you're interested in seeing the budget report, also to keep that handy as a resource, perhaps. Do you have some extras, Susan Manager? I didn't bring. Thank you. I know this impacts the budget. Sorry to have interrupted okay. you there, Mr. Ghosh. Good evening. Good evening. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, I'm here just to give a brief update uh, on the FY21 technology budget. Uh, since uh, special town meeting uh, and the approval of the additional classrooms across several buildings, uh, I've had to make some adjustments to help prepare for the technology that will need to be placed uh, in those rooms. Uh, so at this point, I am asking for an additional $119,000 in the technology budget uh, to address those those needs. Uh, I have a breakdown. I, I think it was in the packet. If not, I can get you it all is. a copy of the breakdown. But essentially, uh, the money will pay for um, the primary tech in each room. So uh, the, the six rooms here at the high school, we're talking about additional projectors for those classrooms. We're talking about wireless access points to bring connectivity to those rooms. Um, and then at some of the uh, modular rooms, we're also looking at uh, some additional equipment like Chromebooks because Hopkins depends on Chromebooks. So we're looking at some additional Chromebooks for those classrooms uh, in Hopkins and Elmwood. So it's really to support those primary structures. Um, and then the last item on the list is uh, having some extra money for the additional FTEs of, of staff that we'll have, the new staff. And planning for you know roughly 15 FTEs uh, for new computers for those staff when they they arrive in the summer and the fall. So those various items add up to to that amount, uh, and I'm happy to to answer questions on the various spaces um, if you have any. Mr. Gosh, you've given us two options. 
right? One is the, can you explain a little bit around that? Sure. So the, the one way to do it is just to pay outright um, for all the equipment in year one. So that, that total amount of 119000 would just be an outright purchase of that equipment. Um, in year one. The other option is to, to, to divide that equipment cost over a three-year lease. So you would look on an average of about $40,000 a year uh, to lease the, the equipment. It would be a lease to own uh, purchase on some, some of that equipment. So that would be the difference in the two. So that could help alleviate some of the pain this year. I think the downside of leasing, obviously, is just additional management and paperwork to, to do that um, and may cause increases in, in those next couple of years uh, to pay those off when we do have some other leases that are coming up and that will have to be refreshed in years um, two and three. So up front is savings for us this year. Um, you know, the downside would be additional paperwork management of it and um, possibly increases to the budgets next year and the following year as other leases come on. And, sorry, it, with regard to the if we leased for three years, you said some is a lease to own, but that implies to me that some would not be le leased yeah, to own. So, so that most of it is um, so that all the computers, yeah. all the Chromebooks, um, all of the all of the equipment, like uh, the access points, could be. It would basically be a lease to own purchase of that equipment. But would the projectors? Would we own those at the end as well? Correct. Yeah, so instead of, it's, what's well, not, if we take lease out, it's basically yeah. like a <laughs> three-year payment plan, payment. yeah, okay. if you will, for, for that equipment. Um, and then we would own it at the end. Other questions? Um, just some comments. So, 104 Chromebooks, $46,800. How necessary are those Chromebooks to student learning? So those Chromebooks would help, um, the four new modular classrooms at Hopkins. And Hopkins is currently a one-to-one -one environment with Chromebooks. Uh, and because Hopkins has a lot of new curriculum that is digitally based, those are very important in, in that area. And so so, so much so that they wouldn't have access to the curriculum if they didn't have those devices. Okay, and the four projectors that cost $10,000. Yeah, part of the cost of the projectors is the equipment itself, but also then the installation cost. So as a, as a municipality and a school district, we have to pay prevailing wage to install those projectors and to run cables to those projectors, which on average costs about $500 to $600 to install the projector itself. Then there's the additional cost of the, of the projector. So are we required to pay top dollar for these tech devices? Um, projectors, Chromebooks. We can typically I? pay state contract price for those yeah. projectors, um, so those would match the same types of equipment that we have in all of the other classrooms um, throughout the district. They would be Epson uh, short throw projectors. I'm just thinking about what Becky Abate has just told us about the dire need for teachers. Sure. So I'm having a hard time swallowing $120,000 for more tech. Sure. Because my, my feeling, and I know that I might be unique in this, is that the Chromebooks are useful and nice and a complement, um, but sometimes they can be used as a babysitting device for the students because there's just not enough staff. That's just my thought. Yeah. Other thoughts, comments? Question, the projectors are, is that, what I know, we don't use the that? smart boards, but it's like the Epson. Is that what that is? It's not. Yeah, just it's the, similar to yeah. that device up but there. It, it allows the interactive on the board type of correct. thing. Correct. So yeah. what we try to provide the elementary schools, really K through um, five, is an interactive projector, right? Um, where they have the pens or they can touch and, and manipulate the board. Uh, whereas uh, upper levels, they have uh, non-interactive projectors, so those are, are a little bit cheaper. And this is the standard for, we're establishing the same standard in existing classrooms in the new classrooms. Correct. This is not going above and beyond. This would provide We're parity. trying to maintain what we, what we currently have in, all, in equity and what we have in the other classrooms. So teachers typically have a device that they require and need, so that's part of it. They're also looking to have a projector, which is standard in every classroom, and wireless access in every classroom. Yeah, and I guess I would just like to reiterate what you've already said about curriculum at Hopkins. So much of the curriculum now is digital that without these devices at Hopkins, kids would really not be able to access our everyday curriculum. Correct. 
Any other thoughts? I guess uh, on Ramayan, I hear you, um, Meg, to what you are talking about about you know the use of technology in young hands, and I think that's a larger conversation that we have talked about in the past uh, with regard to um, how is technology helping for the educational outcome, and um, you know it's become a necessity. I guess, and if this is what you say, you know, this is needed with these classrooms that are coming up. To me, I'm more inclined to go with the 40,000 approach and um, think and hope that the increases would be minuscule, if at all, in the upcoming years. I mean, the way I see it, it's 119,000 versus 120 based on what you have proposed. So I am more inclined to go with the uh, installment approach, if you will. Okay. Right? I wonder what others' thoughts are. I wonder what Susan's thoughts are on that. Yeah. It really. Well, that's a good point, too. I mean, the, the budget that has been presented tonight has the full 119 mm -hmm. in there. Um, you know, the, it, it's pay now or pay later. Mm -hmm. So knowing, looking out to future budgets, we will continue to need staffing. We do have other leases that will need to be renewed. So just continuing to carry the cost. You know, it's it's a decision of, of now or later. We're already well over the guidance. Um, so it's it's a matter of making those decisions. Was there anything that needed to be removed from the budget that we saw most recently in order to accommodate? I mean, mm. as a teacher, I completely understand you can't operate anymore unless your kids have access to this technology. You, It's not something that's really negotiable. You don't even budget for paper the way you used to in order to have paper activities. So, I mean, you know, paper's cheaper than a Chromebook, but it needs to be done. But what are we nixing in order to... to at, at this time, we did not search for 100000 to take out of the budget okay. to accommodate this. Um, so, you know, again, it's it's a budget necessary to accommodate the growth not only with staff but with building infrastructure and this is part of the part infrastructure of that is common in in every classroom that we're okay. putting forward um, i have one related question is this a one-time purchase yes and if so would it not be part of our capital articles then this type of purchase we typically would not put through because each item individually is less than 25,000. Okay. Mr. Banning, would you have any thoughts on this at all? Uh, not at this time. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess I'd like to make a motion that we do it based on uh, 40,000, do it in an installment basis, primarily coming from the fact that we are still in negotiation and, you know, uh, with regard to the amount and, you know, all the needs that we have, we have certainly heard some tonight. Uh, the, here's an opportunity which we can spread over years. There are some which we won't be able to spread over years. So it's only three years and it doesn't look like there's a huge difference in terms of the monetary aspects. And I would imagine that the reason why you brought up both the options is you think that's possible. Right. Um, so I'd like to table that. So what can I, what is the down, other than what you've already said, are there any other downsides to spreading it out over three years? I mean, besides the additional, I guess there's a little bit of an interest that's low, but there's going right. to be the interest in the, you know, the payout. You but typically lease our Chromebooks though, right? Correct. Yeah, that's Dude, the typical. That would be standard for what we typically correct. do. Correct. So our, our large equipment purchases are typically, teacher laptops and, and student devices are typically leased over, you know, leased to own over three years. Okay. So that is the standard that we, we do. So beyond the things I mentioned, I don't see any other downsides to it. Okay. Do you want to second that? Yeah. Yes. So, just from a procedure, sorry, a procedural thing, would we wait to actually vote on this until we vote the entire budget? Um, I we guess don't typically vote. Just I'm asking, kind of procedurally, that this is this is a report similar to what you heard when each department came and presented their budget. So, further comments or you know. Um, how you would like to proceed would come when we're when we're talking about the actual budget. Okay. 
Okay, that's, that's right. Go ahead. Can you just one more question sure. about the leasing? Um, do we get a different kind of support? Like, should it, something break or it be faulty? Is there any kind of... Um, that the support is typically built into the cost of the device, right? So if, if you're looking at a single Chromebook, we typically buy accidental coverage for that device. Uh, and that gets built into the cost of the lease and whether spread out over. Whether buy outright or whether we lease. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so that, okay. that cost is going to be the same right. either, either way. So perhaps, Nancy, uh, to what you're saying, we can go with a general directive perhaps mm -hmm. uh, based on what the committee feels. Unless someone feels strongly that we should go with 120, I would uh, move towards spreading it over three years. I'm just wondering about the, that, yeah. sorry about like the projectors where there's a labor component, like it's sort of a one, it's sort of part of the classroom. Mm -hmm. To me, I see that differently than the Chromebooks or the teacher laptop. So I don't mm -hmm. know, is it an all or nothing? Like, would we buy fixtures that are sort of permanently part of the classroom, but lease more like the consumable things that go to student to student or teacher to teacher? Does that make any sense? It, I mean, it like does. I look at this. I know nothing about this, but I'm looking at the labor, and the, it's a permanent install. To me, I think when we put up a classroom, part of, just like we buy furniture, it part of setting up a classroom is putting in the requisite equipment. Mm -hmm. And if it's fixed like that, I kind of feel like we should buy it. Correct. I would say that typically in most years, we don't lease to own projectors. So we plan for them strategically over the years and replace them when need be and pay them in small chunks over the years. I mean, I don't mean to complicate the, the upfront paperwork, mm -hmm. but to me, logically, it makes sense to kind of separate out the laptops and teacher divide, uh, laptops from the installed projectors and sort of one-time permanent expenditures. Right, and I would also look to see if some of this could be part of the capital uh, ask. Okay, any other thoughts? Do you mind if I make sure. one comment, please? Because um, I, I really wanted to um, address your comment, Meg, because I can see and feel your discomfort. And I think that many, many of us in the classroom feel that same sense of angst. And we feel torn often between that human being who's educated and highly trained and skilled versus some of the power that technology can bring. And, um, I've had the opportunity over the past year and a half to sit in a lot of meetings with a lot of teachers and a lot of our administrators. And what I hear is a lot of caution in terms of how we use technology and a lot of careful thought about why we would leverage technology in a certain, um, at, for certain purposes, but not for other purposes. Um, I hear a lot of people thinking about how can we enrich using the technology and um, bring places and things and ideas to students that we couldn't ordinarily in the course of a school day through technology, but also um, very, very deliberate decisions on the part of teachers and administrators in terms of how and when and why um, we do use it. And I appreciate that, Mina, you said that as a conversation for a different day, but I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't at least share that those are conversations that we're all having because no one wants to misuse it um, with students and we appreciate that it's the human being in front of students that is the most powerful um. and, and and i hear you and i do understand the complexity of it and i do support these technological items but on the other hand i have been teaching for 30 years and i use my mouth and we read books and we talk and you know what they make progress yeah. So, you know, when we're in this kind of crunch, to me, this seems a little bit like ornamentation and not as necessary. I know there's so much curriculum that you have to access on Chromebooks now, supposedly, but we're just feeding into the capitalist system. We're doing nothing to resist it, ever. Thank you very much. All right, um, so back to our um, request here. Is there a general um, guideline that's clear? Is, is that helpful? Are you looking for anything else from the committee tonight? I think the, the feedback I've received is, is helpful. And I think moving forward, based on what happens with the final budget, we'll kind of make some decisions to try to lease the equipment we can, it sounds like, and, and kind of move forward depending on what happens uh, with the budget. Thank you so much, Mr. Gersh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Joe. Next item on the agenda, Dr. Kavanaugh, your report.
Yes, so my report is broken into um, two different segments. The first part of the superintendent's report is my FY21 budget presentation, and this is obviously the budget that I am recommending to the school committee tonight. Um, as you know, this budget is something that is um, put together over a very long period of time. We were sitting here back in September discussing budget, and here it is January, and we come to you with sort of our final product. So in preparing for that, uh, we really did try to put together something that would provide a level service for Hopkinton, uh, and ma making sure that we are maintaining Hopkinton's exceptional academic and extracurricular programs. So what we have in this budget will make sure the kids are getting um, what they are getting today. Uh, there are times when we are able to offer something more and when we're able to offer something more, um, sometimes that comes from our operating budget, sometimes it comes from grants. Um, you saw these uh, STEM and the CVTE people here earlier this year and that was absolutely entirely grant funded. Um, another goal that we have is to offer curriculum and instruction that meets the needs of every single one of our learners. So not just our highest functioning learners, not just our kids who are struggling, but every kid from um, you know, whatever varied needs a child has would be met in, in our public schools. Uh, we have added a significant number of teachers, special educators, and support staff to accommodate increases in our student population. Um, we have ensured that our school facilities will support that kind of growth and I want to again say thank you to town meeting for um, their generous support. Uh, we are looking to support the growing social and emotional needs of our students and so we've added multiple positions that will support that and obviously we have to be attentive to our school improvement plans. Naturally, there were some challenges along the way. Uh, increased enrollment, while it's sort of a, a blessing to have so many students with us and so many people who value public education here in Hopkinton, um, increased enrollment is always a challenge because it's happening so quickly. And I feel like we struggle to sort of keep pace with, with the students who continue to be before us. We have had increased transportation needs, so with more students comes the need for more buses. Uh, we have additional social emotional learning programs. We have opened or we will be opening 14 new classrooms that comes with a cost. Mr. Ghosh's presentation tonight is an indication of that. Uh, we have to safeguard our instructional uh, excellence and we also have to be attentive to those unfunded mandates. Uh, just to give you sort of an idea of our enrollment growth in 2015-16, According to our October 2015 SIMS report, we had 3,463 students in the Hopkinton Public Schools. The October 2019 SIMS report was at 3,862, an increase of 399 students. And I think that if we gave you that number today, uh, we would clearly be well over 400 students. I've shown these slides several times, so I will not belabor the point. Uh, but you know that we have enrollment projections. They were done for us by a consultant through DRA. And if you look at uh, the 2009-2010 school year, we had 198 students in our kindergarten class. That number has grown to 291 students in that cohort of, of learners. Uh, you can also see how the kindergarten enrollment growth has increased over time from 198 to, in this year, 269 students. I say all the time that when we opened Marathon only a couple of years ago, we anticipated having 204 students in our kindergarten classroom, and by the end of the school year, we had over 270 students in our kindergarten class. So um, there's no doubt that we are growing in enrollment. Now, these are the numbers that are projected. And I think that while we were building this budget, we kept this in mind. So our additional 14 classrooms, as well as additional classroom teachers. And while we are asking for an enormous number of teachers, I think when we first met with the building principals, we had about 57 positions on the table. Obviously, they are not all still there, but many of them are. And those 57 positions were there because of some of the data that you see on this slide right here. If we do that same uh, sort of metric with where are the kindergarten classes in 2021, it's projected to be 275 students. And if we follow those students over their, a 10-year period in the Hopkinton Public Schools, you get to 423 students. 
those numbers, if they bear out, are um, something to give us great pause. Uh, this will help you to sort of see where we have come from June 15th to the present day, how many kids have entered, how many kids have exited. And so you can see that grade one, two, and three have added 27, 29, and 20 students, grade four, 21, grade eight, 20. So in those grades, you are seeing that there are whole classes that have come into, into our district. And really, when you think about grade two, it's really a class and a half, so to speak. So there are lots of students who are coming here, and we are really, you know, as I've said, just trying to keep pace with the growth. Last year, I shared this slide. So these are the 2017 per pupil expenditures that are offered to us by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I know people had asked me last year, how did you choose those districts? And I think that they are all districts that perform well. They're districts that sort of end up in a place where you know, we are frequently comparing ourselves, whether it's because of size or uh, proximity to Hopkinton. And so you know, for all of those reasons, we included them. And you can see that Hopkinton in 2017 was ranked 24th in that list. And we had a per pupil expenditure of $14,557. If we advance that slide to 2018, Hopkinton is at 27 now with a per pupil expenditure of just slightly over $15,000. I mean, I think one of the things that this illustrates is that if you look at our per pupil expenditure and we're at number 27, uh, when we start to look at where we are in terms of academic performance, you're going to see that we are typically always in that top 5 to 10% by whatever metric. Um, so we are doing a whole lot better than our per pupil expenditure would dictate. I think Hopkinton families and children get an awful lot of bang for their buck. Dr. Kavner, if you wouldn't mind going back to the previous slide just quickly sure. to look at the state, comparing it to the state a little bit. Is that the state average? Number yes. 17? Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you wouldn't mind. So you can see that in, in 2017 we were below state average. And you know, once again, in 2018, we are below state average for per pupil expenditure. So we're below state average in per pupil expenditure, but we are significantly higher than state average in academic performance. I don't see which number is the state average. I'm 20, missing 20. Number okay. 20 on this one. About 1,500. Yep. Uh, so here, and I, I showed a very similar slide last year. This shows us some of you know, our performance excellence and our performance needs. The green cells are the ones that place Hopkinton in the top 5% statewide for ELA, math, or science ranking. The top 6 to 10% statewide has yellow in the cell, and top 11 to 13% uh, would be those cells that are in that peach color. And you know, as you take a look at that, you can see that there are very few that are in the 11 to 13 percent, but most of those cells, our kids are in that top 5 percent statewide. And so even if our ranking might be 14th in the state, say for example in grade 10 math, you can see that we are still in the top 5 percent. Um, and if you take a look at the number of high schools with 303 districts, when we say that we're in the top 5 percent, we're very high up there in that top 5 percent. So we are looking really, we're looking really good on this slide. And last year's data was you know, very similar. So when people will say, are, are the Hopkinton public schools in some kind of decline because of our extreme enrollment, because of space constraints, at this point in time, I think that we are doing still, according to at least MCAS testing metrics, we're doing well. And I don't want to say that we can sustain that forever, because I think I've repeatedly said like, numerous times that while we are sort of treading water right now, we absolutely need the personnel that we're asking for to ensure that, that our rankings stay where they are. Uh, here's a little performance highlight for us. Um, if you take a look at where Niche said we are, and obviously uh, we've had slides before where you know, we talk about being you know, sixth according to new, U, new, US News and World Report, and all other, and last year um, uh, the Commissioner of Education said that we were, you know, one of four high schools to be considered a school of recognition. Uh, so we have a whole lot of accolades out there. Um, but you can see that uh, Niche is ranking the Hopkinton Public Schools as number two 
um, in the state of Massachusetts, and that is not just our high school, but that's our K-12, the entire district, number two out of 218 in the state of Massachusetts. So there's an awful lot to celebrate. All right, so I will let Mrs. <laughs> Rotherick take over from here and talk about the numbers. Okay. So you have heard the presentations over the last couple months in terms of each department. Um, what this is showing you basically is the, the FY20 operating budget, the increases um, are for 9%. The majority of that increase is salary, um, which is a very typical. And you can see the expense increase at 1.4%, salary at 76 so in total right now, the current ask is for a 9% increase. Does that include this? That includes the 119. Okay. That's correct. Do you want to push? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> so again, you know, this is a, a very typical slide that we always show. Um, and this really is for any municipality. We're really a, a service industry. So when you are talking about needs of a district, it typically falls within the, the salary category. Another way to look at it is by educational program. So you can see the, the majority is your regular education and then student services. So again, looking at the program as a whole in terms of the budget, um, that's where your teaching is. Of course, within technology, there is also teaching, but it is also support and infrastructure. And you can see what the percentage um, of all the other departments of where they are in terms of the total budget. Um, and the next visually is really just breaking it down by the cost centers that presented to you over the past couple of months. Um, when you look at this, basically you can see the elementary schools are all around the same percentage in terms of what it costs to educate the elementary student. And then rightfully, as, as students move on, it becomes more expensive um, in terms of per pupil. So middle school jumps up to 13% and then high school at 18%. And that's a typical progression within a, a school district in terms of the cost to educate a student at each uh, grade level. Mr. Othermick, um, you know, besides the school, all these other aspects that you have as cost centers, I would imagine a lot of those are allocated further into the schools, right? No, those are completely separate. So for instance, uh, transportation has been pulled out. So that's not reflected within within those um, schools, building and grounds, which includes your utilities, is completely pulled out. That's only in building and grounds. So if, uh, if we look at student services, for instance, the 21.6%, which is a sizable chunk, right? Mm -hmm. I would imagine that uh, you know, that's spread across different schools, isn't that? That right? is, that is K, pre-K through 12, correct. OK. Is that the question? Yes. OK. Yeah, so for instance, building and grounds, that's for all of your district buildings. It's a small sliver, but the vocational, is that non keef tech? Or that's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, so when you break down and look at the salaries, uh, the first piece that you look at are the contractual obligations. Those are existing staff moving up according to the, uh, the contracts. And then the uh, FY21 staff requests that you heard from each of the departments. So 4.7% is just moving up your existing staff. And so this is where we talk about it being difficult to stay within guidance when that really is just rolling over. Our, our existing staff almost eats up that full amount uh, in order to move forward and does not accommodate for, for growth. And some portion of the 21 staff requests are already in place. They are post-budget, but they're already in place. And others are incremental, correct? So the 
21 staff requests are the ones that are new. Yeah. Anyone that has already been approved that has come to you this year yeah. is, is rolled into the, it, it's not part of the new requests because that's already been approved. Even if it was after last year's budget? That's correct. Okay, thank you. because they already are a contractual obligation. Like Correct. they live here and work here now. Correct. Okay. But sometimes we put them under new headcount. You know, when we have yes. different kinds of slides, we, we sort of bundle them differently. Yeah, so I was just trying to clarify. So this is what you can see in terms of the new staff requests. So these are not people that have already been approved, brought to the school committee and, and um, move forward. Uh, so the largest portion, as you can imagine, is, has been the teaching requests. And again, as we've talked about, so if you bring in one teacher, then you also have to bring in elements of the related arts around that one classroom teacher. So when you're increasing that one class size for 20 students, it's really 1.4 teachers. So you have 13.5 FTEs that are being requested for classroom. Student services, 8.6. Administrative, 1.5. Social emotional, 1.2. Support, and this is across many departments. You saw a lot of 0 0.2, 0 0.5. And in past budgets, we have actually cut those in order to make it to guidance. And what you're seeing with um, almost every department that presented, they can't make it work with the, the way we're going, the direction building and grounds, the three FTE custodians that we spoke about, and then technology. And maybe just a little bit more clarification about those dribs and drabs of point two. You know, if you are adding 13.5 teachers, that means that HR is onboarding them and ensuring that they, you know, have uh, their retirement set up with MTRS and, you know, all of those smaller pieces. and. We're doing that also for all the people who are already here, you know, or offering different services. So at some point, you just have to add just a little bit to every single one of those places. And when we're looking at, you know, secretarial staff for your AD or secretarial staff for, you know, or additional people in, you know, the finance department, it just adds up and it doesn't feel like we need those four people. But because we have, as Susan said, cut them over time, we really need those four people or four FTEs, really, They're multiple people. So again, looking at the uh, expense side, in, in terms of you know, percentage of the whole budget, at, like we, we spoke about, the increase in expense uh, is 675,000. So it's a 6.9% increase to just the expenses. And again, so this is just the expenses broken down again by those educational programs. And this is where you start to see some of the things that are really contractual in terms of, um, they're not discretionary. Transportation, 28%, not discretionary. Out of district tuitions, um, building and grounds in terms of maintaining the buildings. So you really get down to what you would consider discretionary is in that regular education um, bucket. Or it, it, it really breaks down to a very small percentage of where you can really control expenses. Um, but that just gives you a different look. So looking at the expenses in terms of what has increased to bring us to where we are. Uh, transportation, one of the biggest increases. We have a $110,000 increase with special education transportation. Homeless was 5,000. And regular transportation is 233,000. 140 of that are those two new buses. Uh, so again, those are the pieces, non-discretionary, but a very large impact. Technology, we spoke about the 119 um, of that 208. Building and grounds, really getting in line, um, bringing in the capital that is under 25,000 into the operating budget where it belongs, making sure that we have the preventive maintenance contracts that are necessary. And then you can see some of the smaller uh, contractual obligations that make up the rest. 
the last two pieces, you can see our special education tuitions have decreased and our vocational tuitions have decreased. Before we move on to that, course, are, yeah. um, I think the report is excellent, the way it has been brought forth. I'm th very thankful. I know we talked about it at the last meeting, and we were going through the vacation schedules, and yet you were able to produce this uh, and bring the pie graphs for some of us who are interested in this. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, this is very helpful. I also found the commentary that you have in your uh, big 75-page document very helpful. Um, to me, it showcased the various areas that are being, um, you know, being met, how thoughtfully everything, each and every area. I was happy to see so many things being touched upon, right? Uh, whether it is need for paraprofessionals, whether it is, you know, need for training, whether it is support staff, whether it's technology. Um, it's such a big long process and uh, it was very clear to me, very evident how much thought has gone into it. So I really appreciate the very, very thorough work that has gone in here and you made it uh, available and open to the community. So thank you uh, for doing that. I have one question uh, with regard to the process and um, I was just wondering, you know, some of the things that we heard tonight uh, with regard to the teacher's needs. Um, to me, it seemed like when you addressed it through the budgets, I felt like you had gone through that process and brought forth the best you know, needs. You know the constraints, right, of the budget, that we don't have an unlimited budget out here. And you have made the best uh, <coughs> proposal possible here. So I'm wondering how much are the teacher voices part of the process? And um, you know how how much of that is considered as part of the process? And that's probably a good question for each of the building principals because I believe that what happens in each building is very different. Mm -hmm. So when Mr. Bishop was here, you know, he articulated that he sits with every one of his subject matter leaders and has a conversation, multiple conversations, with you know what is it that we absolutely need, what is it that we can live without, um, and you know if you read um, Mr. Keller's annual town report, what he'll submit to the town, he'll tell us that uh, his school council is largely influential. So he has teachers on that committee, but he also has parents, he has students. So I think that that might be a very good question for our building principals, mm -hmm. but you know, they obviously don't operate in a vacuum. You know, right. there's an awful lot of information. And I think when they also look at what they're putting forth, they have an awful lot of data. You know, so how many times did a student need to, you know, visit the guidance counselor at Hopkins, for example, and, you know, was she able to service as many children as she needed, or were we required to send kids back to class at particular times? And, you know, I think that they're very thoughtful, so had there been a need for an addition to additional guidance counselor, you know, that would have been put on the table. And so I think the other thing that happens is, you know, the principals would like to have a lot of things, and so when we all sit at the table, there are at times things that we have to say, you're going to need to choose. Will it be A or will it be B? And even with those difficult decisions, we're still currently at 9% when the guidance was 5.54. Uh, but, you know, when you look at those numbers of kids enrolling in our school, they're really staggering. So, you know, I think we are where we are because we've made some very thoughtful choices. And I think we are where we are because in all of our heart of hearts, we believe that this is what's right for children. Right. Now, um, I appreciate you sharing that. We talked about a little bit about the inclusion of the SMLs in the process, and um, that's the only aspect is that you know all voices are heard and are part of the process. And what you have brought forth, to me, just looking at the memo, seemed like a lot has gone in um, to the process. And uh, one, you know, of course, nine percent is not a small amount. And um, I'm thinking there are aspects where you have looked at efficiencies, and those are part of the process as well, as you have um, brought this forward. Um, so to me, um, I think that I, I applaud the great work 
that that you have done um, and I'm also wondering if there have been conversations with our town partners I know we have not had a budget advisory council this year so it's most of the conversations have happened with you and uh, our town manager uh, and our perhaps the CFO so if you would share um, any updates on that front with regard to budget co uh, conversations yeah. I think we've just been keeping them apprised of where we are in the process. Uh, and, you know, as you know, when we started this process and 5.54 was the message, uh, Mrs. Rothermick and I at that time at the Board of Selectmen meeting put up a slide that said, you know, just to be able to fulfill our contractual obliga obligations. And at that point in time, it was an estimate. We knew we would be over 4%. And tonight you saw that it was 4.7%. Um, so with budget guidance of 5.54 and contractual obligations at 4.7, I think we've been able to help you know, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Kamalo, to see that, you know, the needs of the schools are substantially greater than that. And, you know, we always update them on our enrollment progress. And maybe there's other things that I haven't mentioned. Well, um, as Dr. Kavanaugh stated, you know, we have been meeting regularly with them, and they're still in the process of their departments and refining as well. So whereas we are just a piece of the pie, um, a large piece, you know, they're looking at it holistically in terms of all the departments and figuring out how to or not can we move forward and, and, and they'll let us know. Thank you. Can I just ask a question um, about that Budget Advisory Council? Is, the, is it typical that we don't meet? I mean, no. that's an opportunity for the select board in addition to you to meet with your counterparts on the municipal side. My understanding is that it's an opportunity for the select board to be engaged in the conversation with the chair and or the vice chair. So I'm just wondering, is it, is, does this typically happen? Is there a reason why we've changed process this year? Or? Mr. Manning is here. We have tried, you know, we've been having some conversations, uh, exchanging emails to get together. I guess part of it was the holidays and some busyness and availability. I don't know, Mr. Manning, if you had, if you want to come up and speak at all. In terms of years, Pat, I'll just say while he's walking up. Last year, for example, we met every month starting in September. And I know there have been efforts. I just, I, if I were on the select board, having to review a budget for the town, um, I guess I'd want to have some, some insight, some direct insight and conversation leading up to it for the biggest chunk. So I just was curious about the process. So I do believe the process is that all the departments are submitting their requested budgets, yeah. and that's when the discussions are going to start, when we see where we see where we are. We've had the budget message, and at some point we know what the, the levy capacity is. We know what we can take, but we, you know, to say here's the school budget, we don't know what the other departments are. It's going to be a... I think the message was that it has to be an a has to average out. So, I think, I, I from my point of view, the, the school budget message is clear. You know, from uh, what I've been hearing, and I have not heard the the other municipal side, and that's when it's all going to come together. So, I believe I did ask uh, Town Manager Norman Kamalo when we're going to start these meetings, and he said after he did. Uh, this was right before the holidays, and uh, he did say right when everyone when he sees the budgets because they haven't submitted them yet, so he doesn't really know where to go yet. So I do believe it is going to. I I was even thinking maybe this Monday or this or next week, but it is going to be soon. We're going to start uh, the, me the the meetings to go over the for the different departments. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Um, other thoughts? Just in one more thought on that advisory group because I do think just the name of it it's an advisory group so i feel like if the departments were able to meet together as you said starting in the fall once the budget message is received i think then everyone would have a much clearer picture of sort of like here's what we think we want in each of those departments and here's the reality of what we're able to do i feel like if we wait until everyone has their budgets in place there's no sense of like here's what we didn't get that we really felt like we, this, I don't even want to use the word want, but I mean, you know, we have 300 students that, and 13 new teachers, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I think we want more than that. And based on what we heard from the, the um, HTA tonight, the teachers are looking to, to receive more support. So I feel like from the perspective of a, of 
like Amanda's question, if it's an advisory group, then they should be advising each other about what their challenges are during the, the process of developing their budget, not waiting until the budgets are done to go at it and see who needs to take back what in order to create something that the town is able to survive with. So, you know, for whatever it's worth, looking at next year, it needs to start earlier. It needs to be something that's consistent monthly. I mean, I thought that's what it was going to be. Right, so did I. So the fact that it hasn't happened yet and our budgets are due in whatever, a week, two weeks, is concerning because I feel like, yes, we've been very vocal as a school about, as, as, as a district, what we need but and, and, what, and what our challenges are, but I don't have a clear idea. And if we had a representative from the advisory committee, I don't have a clear idea what, of what's going on in the, our fire department and our police department. I don't have a clear idea about the challenges of the town um, you know, offices and, and how you know, a bigger population, I'm sure, is affecting them. So I think we need to make sure that it, it, it's not something that slips through the cracks until January, and it should be something that people are talking from September. It just as a point of clarification, it doesn't include the fire. It, it, it includes the chair of the select board, the chair of the board of appropriations, the chair of the school committee, the two finance, the, the, our finance director and the town one, and then the superintendent and the town manager. And the town manager. So we do get some from the town manager. Right, on, so he in, would have it, some input yeah. on, on those town services. Yeah. But Just the, our, our, our select board counterparts, I think it would be nice for them to have an opportunity in a smaller session to have yeah. dialogue, which is a little bit difficult in a public, in, in, not that it's not, it could, can't be public, but it's a little bit more challenging when it's, you know, in front and of the board done. and you're and you're all done. You're done. So, so I, I don't know, I just I know that there have been efforts on all sides to, to make this happen, but it just seems like an anomaly this year, whereas yeah. I thought we had these more regularly in the past. So. It is an anomaly because I know that in, in years past, it, prior to last year, it also was happening on a, a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to take this feedback back. Um, you know, we have talked, Mr. Manning, myself, and uh, Mr. Ted Stone, we've exchanged emails and we've talked about this. So I'm happy to raise that and escalate that and include all of you and um, see if we can do that, you know. So I even though you have not met as a, a full group, do you feel like that there has been an opportunity to kind of for both sides to hear from the, with the select board and the school to kind of represent to our elected officials where our budget is so we're not coming in as a total surprise to them? So I think um, a couple of things, right? This has been an interesting year, and I, I think we're going a little bit into the, um, the chair report here, uh, is that if you look at this year and this uh, fall getting into the winter season, the special town meeting mm -hmm. was, was something absolutely. absolutely caught us all unaware. And, yeah. you know, we all were in such a rush between November and December to get everything done and ready. Um, so there were a lot of conversations, but it put an additional burden on every department, mm -hmm. every, um, you know, board mm -hmm. at that level. So there were some challenges around that and, you know, big topics out there, right? Um, so th that is one aspect of it. The second aspect of it, so through that, I think there have been a lot of conversations mm -hmm. about needs, right? We went and spoke about our needs, and I think Dr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Kumalo and the CFOs have certainly been in conversation on what's going on. They're the ones, they're the professionals doing the work. In our emails, I've certainly provided updates to both Mr. Manning and Mr. Ted Stone, and you know, Mr. Manning has been uh, very consistently coming and joining us here to know what's going on. Um, so from the school standpoint, the information sharing has certainly happened. Um, I don't necessarily, um, we haven't gotten the chance, like I said, there was the special town meeting right there. We obviously heard the budget message from um, the select board, but since then in terms of formal conversations on what those numbers should be like, I would imagine the select board would want it as close to um, those numbers as possible, but this is, this is where we are and those conversations haven't happened one-on-one, -on -one, if you will, or you know, through that small group. I think it would be helpful, perhaps Mondays, uh, you know, if that's a possibility, we can look at that or some other date. Uh, but I, I will certainly take the committee's uh, feedback and I'll follow up maybe tonight, if not tonight, tomorrow. Um, so with regard to budget, are there any other questions or thoughts uh, for Dr. Kamna? Good? Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kamna. Okay.
So I'll just finish up very quickly with the rest of the superintendent's report. This is just the happenings in our school. Um, and this really is sort of a budgetary issue as well. Uh, so many people are wondering, we've been talking since last January, I think, about the statement of interest that we had submitted to the Mass School Building Authority. And we were very hopeful that we were going to be invited in so that uh, we could start a building project that would address some of our elementary needs. Uh, but Hopkinton, unfortunately, was declined in December. I know that the five of you have that information, but I'm not sure if the community does. So I think it's really important for us to underscore for the town that this year is a year that we were not invited into the MSBA. So I did talk to a representative of the MSBA and sort of asked why. Why did that happen? Because I think that with our enrollment issues, we... I was pretty confident that we had a very good chance. And um, what I was told is that there were 61 applicants across the Commonwealth, 11 were invited in, and essentially Hopkinton was just not as needy as the 11 who were in fact invited in. So I think, you know, there are some ramifications for this. Um, and, you know, people will ask, can we reapply? Absolutely, it's open again, so I could submit the SOI, resubmit the SOI tomorrow morning. And, you know, I will certainly do that in the next week or two so that it will come back to you and you will simply have to approve my submission of an SOI, uh, which, is, which is really great. Um, but there is some kind of concern, I think, when we talk about the long-term planning. So if you think about a building project, from the time that you are invited in by the MSBA to the day that we open our school doors is somewhere about five years. And so if we were thinking that it was important to be able to, you know, sort of find a home for our students that are bursting at the seams at the Elmwood School or the Hopkins School or the Marathon School, and we didn't want to be people who continued to add modular classrooms or to, you know, dismantle art rooms, um, the five-year window is, is not looking good when it's really now a six-year window for us. Um, so, so there will need to be some serious decision-making in the town of Hopkinton. And I think one of the most important things that I will say about this slide is that very last bulleted item on the second block. There is never a guarantee that Hopkinton will ever be invited in. We can continue to submit and resubmit and resubmit, but in the meantime, we have many, many kids at our doorstep and we are projected to have many, many more over the next decade. So I think that we have to, you know, sort of really put our heads together and think about what it is that Hopkinton can and cannot sustain. Uh, so I will resubmit our um, SOI, but one of the things that we put into the capital budget was a feasibility study. And I am recommending that we continue on with that feasibility study. In the event that we are invited in, step number two is the feasibility study, so we will have already completed that step, which is good because it will sort of accelerate our process. Uh, in the event that we are not invited in next year or the year after, we still have that feasibility study for us to be able to say, well, what is the cost of you know, some of our, our options here in Hopkinton? Um, so when we do that feasibility study, we will conduct that study using MSBA guidelines. So if MSBA says the appropriate size for a second grade classroom is X, we will conduct that study so that we're adhering to those kinds of measurements and spaces. And if Hopkinton says, no, we would like to have a bigger auditorium or more storage space, that will be, just be something that we will add on to those price tags and get public opinion on. Um, I think the feasibility study, it makes sense to continue on and do it because it would be required by MSBA. And no matter what, you're not going to build a building without a feasibility study. And along the way, we are just going to have to very carefully monitor space. Is there an expiration date to that feasibility study as per the MSBA anyway? Do you yeah. know that, the answer to that question? It, there is, really but it's a, it's a long time. It is? Yeah. Like more than five years, you think? It's a, I don't want to hold you to anything. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure, yeah, I'm, I'm not okay. sure but uh, like, um, like we said, I mean, we're going to march along as if and follow all the MSBA guidelines, um, but I think it will help to paint a picture to the community of why, where are we going, mm -hmm. you know, so we did kind of that quick look of a 10-year, you know, if you will, district-wide, what could all our buildings look like this would kind of take it to that next step. Do you know, where where are we going with the enrollment projections that we're looking at? 
with the capacity in each of our schools, what makes sense, town lands, you know, the, the really a hard, more comprehensive look, and then putting price tags to some of those options. Dr. <coughs> Dr. Kavanaugh, just clarification. Is there any way that we can proceed without the MSBA stamp? Well, yes, you can. <laughs> well, so, it seems like we, we might need to. <laughs> we might need to, and so that's why I have sort of prepared this slide, oh. because... <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Meg, I'm always in your head. <laughs> uh, because people will say, well, how much is that reimbursement? In the event that you don't get it, what does it look like? And I think we do have to be very realistic about the fact that we may never get that, and we have some building needs. So based on our recent experience with Marathon's MSBA reimbursement, um, in that project, the reimbursement dollar amount was $13,779,363. Uh, the total construction cost was 47129373 And so when you do the math on that, the reimbursement was really only at 29.2%. Now, you know, we can't fib. $13 million or almost $14 million is an awful lot of money to a community. But at some point when, you know, you're talking about housing children and maintaining the excellence of your public schools, you know, it may come to a, a, a time when you really cannot wait any longer for the MSBA. Right, right. I would think we're at that time. Yeah, there are many districts that are taking on building projects now without MSBA reimbursement because they just can't wait any longer. And another question, if we don't have MSBA approval, does that mean that we don't necessarily have to abide by all of those tricky demands about who builds what for how much? Well, no, you still have to do prevailing wage. Yeah, and procurement, uh, procurement law is procurement law. Um, but, you know, again, if we decide that we want to build a bigger core around some of the services, the cafeteria, the gym, which would be beyond what the MSBA may say for X number of enrollment, you can only build this big of an auditorium, this big of a gym, this big of a cafeteria. We as a community may say, well, we're pretty sure of where our projections are going and we'd like to overbuild as a for instance our core so that if we needed to add a wing of classrooms on similar to what we're doing at marathon suddenly your core services are not undersized right, right. like so. if you look at the marathon cafeteria that is already challenged in terms of its size okay but there's a limited number of construction um, companies to whom we can ask for a bid, right? It, it's not a limited in terms of vendors. There's certain laws that you have to follow, and you know, we, those we can't get around, to, deter, and that's determined by the amount of money. And with this magnitude, you have to follow all these steps. Um, so it, it, that is what it is. So if I understand Meg's question correctly, you, are you asking Meg that, let's say we were to rebuild Marathon, right? And if the configuration was just as it is today, rebuild would it- Rebuild Marathon? I'm just, just okay. throwing it out. Uh, just throwing it out there to say that if we were to build a building like that, would it cost us less because we are not following the MSBA guidelines, if you will, would it cost us less? It won't. No. But it will give you more flexibility in design. Build something. Okay. Right. Fair enough. Okay. We might build it differently. Which is right. Yeah. Right. right. So I, I have I have got a couple of thoughts on this. Um, you know, one I think you know this year one of the things that was the focus was the facilities needs, right? And clearly, uh, what we asked for with the ten million and the work that is going underway is, you know, so thankful for that support and that work is progressing in that direction. And um, as we are, um, you know, the other aspect that we had talked about, which I think also got highlighted a little bit in the conversation organization earlier was the human resources and needs around that aspect, right? That what are the teachers who, you know, the programmatic things that might be needed, um, you know, longer range thought process around that, that we're not just looking at, you know, we know this growth is coming up, but we're only planning, we can only do that, right, because of the operational budget, but to look at a bigger plan 
as to what those needs might be and what is it that we can do this year, what may happen next year. So I would hope that that's something we keep in mind, that as we are thinking about buildings, we also think about needs related to human resources, like teachers, right, or um, you know, paraprofessionals or custodians, whatever that might be. So a plan that goes hand in hand with the facilities, I think it's something that I'm interested in us thinking about. Um, with regard to the feasibility study, um, you know, I would want to understand this a little bit more. I wonder if MSBA provides, uh, was this the first time they came for a site visit? Or did they ke uh, come for a site visit um, in the past? Oh, they would have had to for, you know, marathon. Right, they would have had to visit center school. You know. Right, I mean, we have applied for the Elmwood SOI at least three years. That I know of, right? I think more, more. Yeah. So, but was this the first time that someone came for a site visit? To my knowledge. I don't know okay. what would have happened several years ago so, where those would have predated me. Right, and I was just wondering if they provide some kind of a report as to what their findings are. Right. The reason I ask this is because I would like this process to involve the community a little bit so they understand why we are asking for the 700,000, why the feasibility study, what is the MSBA process, what are their findings, what do we think and why is it that we still want to go through this process. Um, so just providing more information around that I think would help a great deal. Uh, when you know we have these solutions that we are looking at in the upcoming year with the high school edition and the portables, um, so just some clarity around that would help me, and I would think it would help the community have those conversations along the process. Um, that's my thought process on it. It's not a small ask, the 700,000. I remember two years ago when we had asked for 600,000, we had initially put that forth and we had pulled it out. Mm -hmm. um, so I would want us to be very thoughtful if we are bringing this forward, A, that we have the capacity to do that. These projects that are coming up in summer are no joke, right? It's, it's going to tie all of you up quite a bit, I would think. And then to take this additional aspect on, we just want to make sure that we are very clear to the community about the processes. That's my thought on that. Just to clarify also, so the statement of interest was for Elmwood, but the feasibility study is the feasibility of the two to five solution, the Hopkins solution, and the high school solution. Is that correct? When we did the capacity study, that kind of gave us that 30,000 foot view of, but I think that if you do this feasibility study, you're going to have a much better sense of what is the right location to, I mean, we've you know, we sat in a room in the town hall with a lot of the key players and the architect, and when we looked at some of those spaces, we said, yeah, to put that two to five school on Hayden Row makes an awful lot of sense. But I think that this will give you a far more granular sense of, you know, does it or does it not really work? You know, as DRA talked to us, they would say things like, yes, it does appear that you could fit a school of that magnitude and a necessary parking lot and, you know, you know, access and egress and all of those kinds of things in that space. But at this point, we are not 100% sure that that is accurate, but that would be their recommendation to pursue that. Um, and maybe you can be more helpful, too, with what else that feasibility study will offer us. But I don't think we're building anything without one. It, right, that's correct. You, you would not be able to build anything without one. But when we write the, the bid specs, basically we will be looking at this around the Elmwood, but in order to look at the around Elmwood, that effectively touches every building. Correct. So it becomes a cascading effect. And so what does that mean, depending on the option that we, you know, that the community decides for Elmwood, it could touch every other school. Yeah. So while it's a feasibility study around Elmwood, it has that cascading effect. And so you have to, you can't do it in a vacuum. Right. Mike. So I guess, I, sorry, I was just wondering because I, I think once we bring in a, an outside service to then dive deep in terms of what our, um, what the feasibility is of a solution, we've given them some instruction of what that solution should 
look like. And once they dive deep and we've spent $700,000 or whatever, it becomes a little harder, a little more painful to change course. So I'm just wondering what kind of opportunities there are for the community and us really, because we really haven't even debriefed amongst ourselves um, following the capacity study. When can we talk about that so that we are instructing the outside service group to do the feasibility on the vision that the community has rallied behind? Because I think somehow I feel like we haven't, again, to Mina's earlier point, there's been a lot going on lately. I mean, with the special town meeting, with, you know, it's been a busy fall. So I just want to make sure that we have an opportunity because there are cascading impacts. Um, to have some conversations before we get too deep and then we feel like, oh my gosh, we've invested $700,000, it's going to hurt to change course. So, so I don't know how other people feel yeah, about so it. So the feasibility study would not be down one path. Okay. If you read the feasibility study for Marathon, yeah. there were yeah. all these different options. Okay. It was building on the field out where Elmwood is. It was okay. you know, yeah. building where Center School is, building where Center School is plus grabbing this piece of property so we wouldn't be going down a, a singular train track okay there would we'd be evaluating all different options and then it would be a chance for the community to come together and have those discussions great. so okay, like i great. said if you look at the marathon feasibility study there were many many options that were part of that feasibility study okay and then it was a cost uh, benefit ratio or analysis yeah. of all those different options that's great because I, I mean I, I'm excited about the vision. I mean I don't don't get me wrong. I'm excited about some of the opportunities that, that this whole path will take us down, but um, I didn't see a lot of variation in what the what DRA presented um, in terms of options. So you know there were two sort of very similar options. I but I'm happy to hear that we're casting a little bit wider net. Yeah, I so like that. The, uh, yes. Quickly, just quickly. I like the idea of the debrief. You know, I don't know what Nancy, your thoughts are, uh, but perhaps that's a conversation to be brought back. Perhaps. So, so what I was going to say was the feasibility study, when it was done before Marathon, before we went down that path, it identified in pretty good detail a number of different potential solutions to the, the, the issue with the, what they had deemed center school is literally obsolete, was the term that they had used, and they then came up with different ways to, in the, it was the elementary school building committee, I think, that actually mm -hmm. did all these focus groups based on, and they had drawings and stuff from the actual feasibility study, so that the community weighed in pretty heavily. Okay. And then it, the school committee at the time, which the predates me, but um, weighed in and, and kind of, they moved their path forward. That sounds it'll good. Give us, yeah, it'll give us an it opportunity for it's lots just, of deep Things reason. happen quickly, so I, it, you know, it's hard to know where we where we can interject and, and get the community involved and when the right time is. It, may, it sounds like after the feasibility study is probably a good time. Yeah, and it looks like there's, um, you know, this is a lot. This is, this is going to be a big project. Many, many millions of dollars is what we are talking about here. Um, and so I think it's important that we bring the community along with us from the very start, right? And I think the uh, capacity study, uh, the timing of it, you know, you had turned it around so quickly because we wanted to do it just before the special town meeting, I, I think, and then we got into special town meeting and then of course the holidays and whatnot. So I, I think it would be a good thing to spend the time, deliberate and talk about, you know, what are, um, how we want to proceed, how do we bring the community into the process because ultimately this is, the bill will be footed by the community and they absolutely need to be part of the conversation. But also teachers and students, we had heard from some of them at the capacity uh, study um, public hearing that we had, I forget what we called it, but I'm just going to call that. Um, I thought a lot of interesting ideas came up. People talked about going taller. There was zoning conversations. So, so many things that came up. And I know not all of that can be answered, but perhaps a debrief and a path forward, right? That how can we uh, move forward with this? And just hearing some thoughts on how do we get those that public input. Um, to get the support that the feasibility study makes sense, even if we don't have MSBA backing. 
because if you look at um, the example that you gave, what cost us, you know, 34 million or 33 million would have co uh, would have cost us 47 million, mm -hmm. right? That's a sizable chunk, right? Thir nearly 30 percent. Mm -hmm. The community has to be okay with it and you know on board with it. This cannot go on that we put in all the work and then it gets rejected. Mm -hmm. right. So everybody needs to be on board. And I think the feasibility study will be helpful too. When we met for the public hearing on the capacity study, it became clear that the need wasn't just one school. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I think what we're looking at on that screen when we talk about you know MSBA reimbursement, we're alluding to a two to five school, for example, but when Mrs. Rothmick talks about that cascading effect, I mean, there's going to be dollar amounts applied to Marathon also because we need classrooms there, or you know, a renovation at the middle school, or what's going to happen to Hopkins if you move kids. So there will be that sort of domino effect that happens all around the district. And I think that a feasibility study might position us for a good 10 year. This is the direction we need to go. And it'll clarify different choices too, so that we can the community will be able to be brought along and, and kind of weigh in and just kind of so that we're not operating out of just the mm -hmm. assumption that what we see is exactly. Yeah. So when we did the, the <coughs> bless you, bless you. the marathon feasibility study, was it an output of that that the um, elementary school building committee was formed, or was it formed in advance of that feasibility study? I can't remember, but I think it was after the feasibility study. Yeah. I'm like 99% so sure. I'd have to double check. I'm getting I'm a much like clearer picture of the sure. feasibility study, so this is yeah. good. And I actually really like, I mean, we, we talk about like a cascade effect, but I actually also think what I've heard from conversations with Dr. Kavanaugh is it's not just a cascade effect, it's a global view. Like, right. it's taking, I love that we're taking a global look at not just a Band-Aid here and a Band-Aid there, but what is best for student learning in the district? And he, here are the facilities we have, here are the students and the needs we have, and how do we put it all together in, in a new mix that makes more sense. And I love that. Mm -hmm. just, and I, I just wanted to be clear on what the feasibility study is. Is it looking at feasibility of one thing or many things? So I feel much better having a, uh, that clarity. So. Right. You know, go ahead. <laughs> we seem to be having a timing one bit. Go ahead, Nancy. I, I, I was also going to say, it also, if we're following the MSBA guidelines, we're taking, we can still keep moving forward to get the funding for whatever solution we come up with yeah. or the feasibility in, mm -hmm. in the community and us all together kind of guides us towards we can still get the funding for the reimbursement of the actual building, which yeah. is. So if it, instead of a six year timeline, maybe we're like a five and a half year timeline, even if we don't get until next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, Save I, us six months. Yeah. And I the guess. feasibility study would be reimbursed at 30%, right? Awesome. So if okay, you spend yeah. your 700,000, you'd get and you get 30% back, 210, whatever that is. That's quick math. <laughs> so, uh, you know, to, to talk briefly about, you know, Amanda, to your thought about the global view, I think to me, besides the facilities aspect, the teacher needs, the need for staff and people, that also needs to be part of the conversation, right? And having that foresight to say what all would we need and what can we do year by year. We're not going to be able to do all of this in one year. We don't have that kind of, you know, money. We would love to, but we don't. So how do we plan for that? And are there any programmatic needs? You know, if you look into 2020, 2030, that's, we are 2020 already. We have to think about 2030, maybe 2040. You know, what are the needs? And do, do the buildings require any kind of configuration if there are programmatic needs around that? So I think it's a big conversation. Uh, perhaps we should bring it back as an agenda item or have a workshop even. As, as a committee and perhaps invite people in and just brainstorm a little bit about what's the approach, uh, the approach we take. So just a thought, maybe we can discuss this a little further. Okay, um, any, anything further? That's all I've got. Okay. It's plenty. <laughs> all right. Okay, um, so moving on to the next item on the agenda, the chair report, I've approved warrants, numbers 20-031 and uh, number 20-032 warrants have been included in your packet. Um, I have one quick update uh, really from the chair perspective is that um, I was at the select board meeting uh, right before the holidays and there was a conversation around when is it that we should put the ballot questions out? 
And so the, there were two dates in question. One was February 3rd, another was March 3rd, which was along with the uh, primaries. Uh, but my understanding with Dr. Kamna was that the preferred date was February 3rd. I thought the select board members brought some interesting points. They talked about the fact that, you know, will you be able to get the number of people to come in and vote on February 3rd? Maybe March 3rd is better because you'll get everyone. There was a monetary aspect to it. Um, you know, our town clerk said that uh, it could cost anywhere from seven to $10,000 to have uh, um, um, the election, the special voting um, aspect that they have to take care of. Um, so there were some nuances around that which were discussed a little bit. And I guess that's where I felt like if we had the Budget Advisory Council, perhaps we could have talked about that a little bit. And I would have loved to get the feedback of the entire committee before being able to say that, because I felt that the understanding was it was going to be February 3rd. But there was a lot of pressure there at that time that we have to take the vote right now, um, because then there has to be preparation for February 3rd. Um, and you know there were some comments that everybody's going to be so tired with all these meetings and ballot questions and whatnot, 2020 with the presidential elections, a lot of um, that going on. But anyhow, it's the February 3rd was what was voted on by uh, the select board. Um, with regard to the ballot question. So I guess we will need people to come out and vote, you know, just the way they came out and supported us mm -hmm. at the uh, special town meeting. I guess we all have to do the work that we need to do on our end, besides what Dr. Kamner has been doing in getting the community to come and support. Um, besides that, um, I guess uh, on the tech front, you know, I've not had a chance to um, circulate that. On the tech front, there was an uh, annual report that was sent out. I would imagine that you have that too. I've not had a chance to review that. I think as part of the process, they send it to the chair. But I, I would like to just circulate that to everyone. And I believe there's also a legislative breakfast that's coming up next month on February 7th. I don't know, Nancy, have you been going to the tech? Maybe we should go in this month if there is one, if we could join you. Yeah, I don't have, I'm not on their email distribution, so I'm not sure what the scheduling is. I don't the, either. Okay. So maybe we can work with Dr. Kavanaugh and figure that out. Uh, but uh, they send that particular, uh, the, the chair, the report to the chair. That's all I have really. Um, besides that, I caught a chance to unplug a little bit uh, during the holidays, so that was good. Just looking for liaison reports. I have a quick plug for the Growth Study Committee is having um, it's the same presentation that we had at our previous public forum, but it's happening at the Senior Center during the day rather than in the mm -hmm. evening. Um, it's next Thursday at 1 at the oh, Senior Center. Great. So if anybody couldn't go to the last one, it's an opportunity for you to come in here. It's the exact same presentation, just looking to, to make it available for folks who couldn't come in the evening. That's great that that's being done. Yeah. 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 I really appreciate that about the Growth Health Study Committee. They're group. making every effort to involve everyone. They are. They're Excellent fantastic. job there. Thank you for continuing to be there. Any other updates? OK. Uh, we'll move on uh, to the next item on the agenda, New Business, Director of Student Services, Dr. Kavanaugh. So as you know, we had a conversation in the executive <laughs> session, and I would like to recommend that the school committee approve a three-year contract for Dr. Karen Zaleski, our current director of student services. So that would run from 2020 to 2023. So moved. Motion Second. By Second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. I'm a yes as well. I um, would like to congratulate Dr. Karen Zaleski. I think she did a fabulous job in this past year. We saw a lot of good things that came out of her work. One was related to the 18 to 22 program. I think that was a great vision there. I also saw her, um, you know, collaborate with the CPAC body and come up with some presentations to make all the new families aware of what are their rights, what are their options that are available. These were some of the things that I have seen, but you have certainly shared so much more, Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, so it's so much appreciated. So many, many congratulations. I'm looking forward to Dr. Zaleski's vision and the work ahead. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts? Good. 
Okay. The next item on the agenda, Elmwood and Hopkins paraprofessional request. All right. So as you could see in Dr. Zaleski's memo, uh, we've had two student move-ins who require um, ABA paraprofessionals. And so we are looking to for the approval of two paraprofessional positions, one for a student at Elmwood and one for a student at Hopkins. Questions, thoughts? Um, just a thought that I often articulate. I just have a concern about so many paraprofessionals rather than certified learning specialists coming into the classroom, um, especially with the growth. And I still feel blindsided by what the HTA presented tonight mm. um, because I, I, that information seems vital to me in understanding why we should have extra paras rather than teachers. So if we could just have more conversation from the teachers in too, that would help. Sure, and it might be helpful to hear from Dr. Zaleski directly, but yeah. when we're looking for ABA pairs, they are typically part of the student's IEP. These are you know, the kinds of pairs who travel one-to-one, -one, collect data on the student, and you know they're very different, I think, from the A pairs that were part of um, Mrs. Bates' speech tonight. Right, right, yeah. right. These are sort of non-negotiable in terms of the IEP. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. absolutely appreciate what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Any other thoughts, comments? Okay, looking for a motion to approve the two special education ABA paraprofessionals. Moved. Second. Motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. I'm yes. yes as well, and so that carries. Um, Next item on the agenda, gift account donation, Dr. Cavanaugh. Sure, this one's really super quick. Um, uh, looters who are a um, landscaping uh, company, so they do uh, lawn trees, shrubs. They have sent us, so graciously, a check for $100, and I just need to, to approve the acceptance of $100. So moved. Yeah, second. Motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. yes. I may yes as well, and so that carries. Thank Moving you. on to the next <laughs> item. All right, the next item. Proposed school calendars. Yep. Are the proposed school calendars. Um, as you know from the beginning of our meeting, we spent an awful lot of time uh, in the summer and throughout the fall with the calendar subcommittee. Um, that subcommittee was made up of clergy, parents, uh, residents, students, teachers, uh, Jen, me, and we really did take a very long look at the calendar. Uh, we broke ourselves into four different working groups. One of them was sort of working around the impact on teaching and learning, uh, what does it mean for the teacher's contract. So for example, one of the items in the teacher's contract says that we can't go to school on the Friday before Labor Day. So you know, as you look at these, you might look at that calendar and say, gosh, it would be really great if we could go on the Friday before Labor Day, but we can't do that. Um, we had a, a couple of parents who got together and put together a very thoughtful survey that went out to the community. And I was surprised at you know, sort of that rate of response but we did get a lot of response and we took all of that very seriously and I think that the results of that are actually <laughs> posted on the superintendent's page if people would like to go in and take a look at you know how how did people feel about that um, but I think that sort of old habits you know kind of die hard and it was uh, the survey along with a lot of the members of the group that felt like the holidays that we are currently observing are very meaningful and important to people in, in Hopkinton or at least the people on that committee. Uh, there were times when I think we may have gotten close to a place where we thought should we sort of eliminate all of them and I just don't think that the appetite was there. So the committee has agreed that we or, a, or another committee would reconvene in a couple of years. So what we have produced for you are two calendars. They are the 2021 and 21-22 calendars. And the only holiday that we have added to it uh, is Diwali and we did that because of the survey results. When we looked at the number of peoples People, like just in terms of sort of almost a bar graph, look at things. Um, there was a very big response to that alongside, you know, the Jewish holidays, alongside Good Friday. So, you know, we just felt like if that many people were requesting this and, you know, we even looked at our, our faculties, you know, how many teachers would have to be out on that day, so would it make sense for us to actually try to uh, sort of replace them with substitute teachers. And in some cases, we felt like it would almost be an impossible feat. And I don't know, Jen, if you want to add something to that, because you were certainly 
very integral part of the calendar committee. <laughs> As the official note taker. Official, yes. We uh, strong arm Jen into being the note taker. <laughs> yeah, oh. no, I, I think you summarized it really beautifully, and I think so did Shazane and Tiffany, who were here earlier. I think it's, I mean, we all know it's very, it's a very emotional topic. And I think the committee members were really sensitive to the needs around the table and the varied perspectives. And, um, you know, we, we had some other kind of model calendars that we looked at. People um, really had an affinity for the Newton Public Schools. You probably remember we talked about that Meg calendar and kind of liked the setup and liked their philosophy and liked the additional explanation of um, the different holidays so we can heighten our awareness, even on days when we are in school, when we know we may have either students or staff who are not with us because they're celebrating something that's important to them and their families. Yeah, so the new calendar obviously has that page two that Jen was mm -hmm. just describing. Um, and hopefully at some point you'll just be able to click on one of those holidays and whatever Shazane has put together will appear. Um, he's sort of that's checking great. with all, with people who are sort of in the know about every one of those um, either holidays, religious observances, so that, you know, we are sensitive to you know what those things really mean and not what we as um, people who don't participate in that perceive that they mean so we thought that was important one of the things that uh, we have noticed is that um, Diwali in 2021 is on a weekend so it wasn't added to the 2021 calendar but it was added to the 21-22 calendar um, and a change for us in 21-22 that I think people will very much like is we have taken the professional development day that is usually on election day because that's not a major election year and we've moved that professional development day to the Monday after Thanksgiving so Ooh, that families will have yes Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday Monday a nice five-day break it's good for social emotional as well so. Good time to book a vacation. <laughs> a very good time for people to plan that getaway. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Kavner, this is not common that two years calendars are presented. Is it primarily to showcase the change? Uh, so it's not typical here in Hopkinton, but there are some school districts that have their calendars drawn out two years and three years. And so as a committee, mm -hmm. we thought it might be prudent to do that, to really see what it was going to look like. Mm -hmm. You know, we could have that conversation, mm -hmm. but then we wanted to sort of see it in its, you know, sort of hard and fast physical sense, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And we brought this also to the admin council. So all of the building principals, assistant principals have also reviewed these calendars. So I'm very thankful that, um, you know, Diwali is going to be uh, a holiday. I, I think it would help the community quite a bit. Uh, I'm just curious to know, I'm sure the composition was very broad. If there were people who felt, you know, I would like, say, the Lunar New Year to be a holiday or some other holiday to be celebrated, uh, were there some conversation about that or were, it was the committee overall uh, I okay, think with this approach. what we tried to do was to say to the people on the committee, you should sort of step back emotionally from this and let some of the data bear out the decision making. Mm -hmm. So when we saw the number of people who would be, or and you know, it's not just the number of parents, but also the teachers, the students who would be interested in something like keeping Good Friday, mm -hmm. that became sort of you know one of those things where the bar graph got very big. So loudly and clearly, we heard. They didn't want to give that day up. Um, but then when you started to look at the Diwali numbers, they were also there. You know, uh, the Lunar New Year numbers weren't quite as high. So um, it, we really decided to look at this from the lens of how will this impact teaching and learning. Now, one of the things that we looked at, too, is in November, it's, it's very strained. I mean, there are a lot of days where we are just out of school, and then so the continuity is missing. And that's why I think we agreed to get back together in a couple of years to see if that continuity is so disadvantageous that we need to make a different decision. Yeah, and, and Diwali tends to uh, be between October and November. So many times it would be in post the 20th. I've never had a Diwali, I don't think, before the 20th of October. Right. But that's the typical time frame. Um, yeah, no, this is, this is a lot of good work. Sorry, Sorry go ahead. Please. So are you voting on both? calendars tonight or just this next year or are we not voting yet are we just discussing I insisted that we're voting it, on both. it does but yeah. I, I actually wonder if we often will wait between when we put the proposed calendar out and right. wait another meeting to vote on it I, I love the work that's sure. been done and I it don't in any way mean to convey no uh, that I don't support it but I do think that it where we have another meeting next week 
would it be possible to put this off? Thank for community. For yeah, community. yeah, for the community to have yeah. it. It Absolutely. could be that they, yeah, I think you know, it's people important. may overwhelmingly love it or they may think, you know, it, why don't we start school on, you know, October 3rd or not, not really. But you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it could be random things that yes. we aren't considering and it would be nice when we pass our calendar to, to feel confident in passing it. Yes, and if people do have the October 3rd question, for example, right, we can yes. always refer to, well, there's the no wiggle room because the contract dictates when we start school. Or, so there Can't are reasons July and, yes. for some of these, and, and I would love for people to understand the reasoning. So, Although there are contract cycles, so it's like three years and another, so if there so isn't, the, yes. That actually was going through my head. Is I, I love the idea of approving multiple years, but I wonder if, we want to also consider the impact of the contract being renegotiated next year will be on the following. Right, right. Although I suppose we could, in the contract, negotiate if we wanted any changes to it, um, in the HTA was amenable to starting the changes the following year or something. Right, sure. Or well, we could always bring that calendar back, you mm -hmm. know, if you True. have a year's time. True. Right. And I really respect all the work that was that's been done to hear the community and the community's voices on on observances and holidays and, and whatnot. Um, my biggest concerns are, you know, really just practical in that, you know, in the last like three years or so, I think we've had not just snow days, but like climate ch change days. We've had wind days. We've had hurricane days. Like, I worry about the end date of some of the years. And this isn't speaking to any one holiday or another. You know, I think it's just... I'm nervous about where we're looking out into June and what that really means. And where, you know, yes, we may have easily five snow days, but then what other days with these, you know, once in a hundred year storms that happen like every three months these days? Like, I'm, you know, I'm just not sure what that means. I also keep an eye toward, like, as I'm sure I know, I know Ms. Parsons does, and everyone does, you know, standardized testing. There are certain dates that are not within Hopkinton's. Purview. We can't influence MCAS. We can't influence AP testing and so forth. And the material just has to be covered. So I get worried about that kind of thing. The cost of, you know, just cooling as it gets hot. You know how you know just sort of the logistics of all of it. So I like the idea of, you know, revisiting as we maybe live with this a little bit. I mean, it's, you know, personally, I I look at districts around us where they've just cut all holidays and I it's harsh but I do see the practical side of it so I, I'm just curious just how as how we see weather patterns playing out and and just life kind of playing out in the next year or two whether this is sustainable and um, you know where this leaves us but I I'm, I'm thrilled that the the community had a chance to provide their own um, needs and thoughts on what works for families in Hopkinton, and I think this is great. We then are going to have to figure out, does this work administratively for the district in the long run? And I, to me, it's still a little bit of a question, just because I, I think that end of June, I think especially looking in 2022, um, I think it was June 20th. It was pretty late. Yeah, it was pretty late. Yeah, 21, 22, it's that June Monday, 20th. the 20th uh, of June. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, I love what I see. I just, I just get nervous just watching. Yeah. You know, I think you make an excellent point, Amanda. In, in fact, on my mind, the first question was the flexible dates, you know, having the op leave the option to the uh, families. But I didn't want to question the committee that I would assume had gone through this process and discussed mm -hmm. all these things, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder what their thoughts were on the flexibility aspect of it. Because, you know, the, some of us want to celebrate Marx's birthday, as we know. Call Marx's birthday. So they should be allowed to do that, right? And well, they are under our school committee policy. It's true. Yeah, the religious <laughs> holidays are all you can. That, that well is true. So yes. I, I, could you just share a little bit around any conversation around flex days that the committee may have uh, looked at? So we did talk about that. And I think when we got to that place, the question became how many students would be absent from school or how many teachers would be absent from school. Mm -hmm. And when those numbers grew very high, we thought, you know, Unless you absolutely change the culture of Hopkinton, and I don't think that that will happen to us in a, in a single year's time. You know, I think we've got to reach that sort of breaking point first, because if you know on Good Friday we have half of our teaching force that doesn't come to school, mm -hmm. we're in, we're in 
a place where we can't have any kind of instruction or if on Good Friday half of our families say we won't be sending our children to school on that day then you know we can't have instruction on that day and I think the four holidays that stood out for us like that um, were Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Diwali and Good Friday. All right, so those are the four, and if you took them out of that calendar, you know, you'd be getting out a whole lot earlier in June, right? So instead of, for example, in the 21-22 calendar where we're getting out on the 20th, we'd be out on, you know, the 14th, which is a nice day to get out. Was there any discussion on Christmas Eve um, by the committee? I know years ago we actually did have a half day on Christmas Eve. Really I don't know if that, about did that, that come up at all? No, we didn't. I, it's been a while since I looked at the survey. Yeah. Was that, did, did that receive any mention in the survey? No. No, I mean, just I'd have to go back and look. Diary. I really don't know yeah, the answer. No, that's to that. okay. I it just, right. Might right. be an opportunity to see. consider. Right. At all. Yeah. yeah, we don't have, no, well, we I guess do depending that. on how the calendar falls, but we would never have, in the current calendar makeup, we don't have school on Christmas Eve. Is that true? Right. It's true. We don't, and we haven't for se yeah. a few years anyway. But I do remember when my older children were young, we used to go, they used to go half a day. Okay. I, I imagine there may be some logistical issues for people traveling, uh, and I don't know if that would impact the teaching and, and teachers not being able to be in school. But I do think what just, one thing we did talk about was that the two years we happened to be looking at, just in terms of how the calendar fell. Yeah was with such a late Labor Day. Mm -hmm. Yes. At the end of this two-year cycle, right. we might be facing a very different ending time, even if the same type of holidays remain. Mm -hmm. It just happened. So it happens the two right. years we looked at it. It's a very late Labor Day. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. Yes. And that, I, I don't remember Labor Day being this late, late as it is this coming year for a while. Yeah, I think lots of interest here on, on this topic for sure. And I also want to just touch base a little bit about Columbus Day. I would be, uh, you know, not, not right because this was something that came up from one of the community members. And I think it had come up in the past when we had a proposed a change. So I just want to clarify that the thought process is that it's Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day, the way we have it. Is that yes. right? Yeah, we didn't rename anything on the okay. calendar. That, that's great. So I just want to make sure that there is not an exclusion at all, but uh, just an inclusion of another holiday. I think the other thing that came up last year, too, was a misunderstanding about what was presented on the first page that you look at, which looks to me like actual days where there's a change in attendance, a day off. or. Half day so or like next year when you said like Diwali falls on Saturday, I think mm -hmm. you don't see it. It's not because we wouldn't mm -hmm. honor it. It's just not a day that we need to give a difference in attendance. Mm -hmm. So, right. No, we. Have, I uh, certainly appreciate all the work that went in. You know, getting all the people just right here. You have lots of thoughts. I can't imagine. You know, with a big group. I can imagine some of them probably pretty passionate over the, just gauging from the community-wide response. I don't ever remember, and maybe somebody else does, but having such a high response to a survey. Mm -hmm. it, it's stunning. Uh, I, I feel like it was over 1,300 parents and a couple of hundred teachers and some students and community members bringing it close to 2,000 maybe, or, or maybe I'm... Yeah. Exaggerating. I really don't remember the numbers now, but I do remember. It was over. It was 1,300 parents. That stood out to me just based on the number of kids we have in the district. It's mm -hmm. a very high percent. Mm -hmm. So obviously, people feel passionately. Yes, That's they do. Anyway, I, we could really feel that passion. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, people hung flyers with, I don't know if they put a QR code on them, but around, I mean, people, I think the people on the committee were really so sensitive to the need to hear multiple voices and hear multiple perspectives shared yeah. that people I do think went more above and beyond than maybe a typical survey would have mm -hmm. to really right. try to engage community members in responding. Well done. Shazane and Love Shanna Love were great Shazane's they were, yeah. the project his project of yeah. made the clickable links on the holidays. I think that's a really valuable thing for the community. I, I agree with that part. I think to me that's the real part is to know what's going on around you, who all is involved in 
just respect each other's holidays. So, um, so I, I want to thank the entire committee, and I guess we'll wait uh, for another week at least to come back for approval. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda, final overnight, Varsity Boys Hockey, Dr. Kavanaugh. Uh, oh yes, so you have already given them pre-approval. This is the final approval for the boys varsity hockey team. They will be traveling to Martha's Vineyard on February 15th and 16th. So we are looking for approval for that. Okay. Motion by Meg, second. Second. Second by Jen. Any discussion? Okay. Looking for everyone's vote here. Yes. Hi. Yes. And I as well. And so the motion carries. The next item on the agenda, accept end of year report. Dr. Kavanaugh. Yeah, so you can see that um, <coughs> under new business. Um, and so when you belong to a collaborative, uh, they have different stipulations. Accept is one that would like for the school committee to vote and approve their end of year report. I believe tech is not one of those. Uh, so you can just see a couple of the highlights in there. Um, Marsha Berkowitz, who had been the director at, Te at Accept for about a million years, has retired, <laughs> okay. and she has been replaced by Donna Flaherty. Uh, you can see just a couple of other things in here that I think are very nice. It's beautifully put together with all kinds of, uh, you know, color and graphics. Um, their guiding principles are on page six. Their strategic priorities are part of it. All of their finances are in here. Um, one thing that I think is interesting to Hopkinton comes on page 10, where you can sort of see uh, the degree to which we use things like home-based services, summer programs, school year programs. Hopkinton is very low there. What we primarily use except for is transportation. Um, so I don't know if you have any other questions or concerns, but uh, the board of directors at except did vote to approve this annual report. Questions, thoughts? Very thorough. Okay. So we're looking for a motion to approve the Accept Education Collaborative Basic Financial Statement for the year ending June 30th, 2019. So moved. Second. Motion by Meg. Second by Jane. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. I'm a yes as well, and so that carries. We don't have old business, any old business tonight to discuss. Um, on the future agenda items, I have a one request. Um, I think, uh, you know, we had started by putting together some goals for the school committee and we had talked about doing a revision in December. So I'd like to bring forth an uh, opportunity for us to just do a checkpoint as to how we think we are doing, you know, what are the op areas of, you know, course correction, if you will, mm -hmm. on that front. Um, that's uh, something that I would like us to bring forth. The second aspect that I want to bring forth is, you know, we had mapped out the calendar until December. I think that worked out fine, but then, you know, the special town meeting really got us all caught up a little bit. So I'd like us to look at the next three months a little bit also um, to see. I think there's a lot of action going on this month. We've been invited to Karen Spelkers, uh, Senator Spelkers event. We have Ms. Renaud's request to come. I heard the kids talk tonight about coming out on uh, the 30th for the international uh, night or so I would like us to just put that all on the calendar and see if well, there's interest we don't all have to go but also plan some office hours uh, we have public hearings, so we just need to see how much we can fit in really um, so just want to bring both of those items uh, perhaps at the next meeting uh, for discussion or the following uh, okay looking for public comments anyone okay now seeing none um, items by consensus all right, and as superintendent, I recommend that the school committee approve the following items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. Does anyone have any thoughts uh, on any of these items? Uh, I thought the minutes were very well done. Georgette's doing a great job. Um, I th thank you so much to Georgette. I wonder if she's listening or watching. She will be at some point. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, hear you. <laughs> so thank you very much. So looking for a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. I'm a yes as well. And so that carries. So I'm looking for a motion for adjournment. 
so moved. <laughs> Motion second. by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. I'm a yes as well. Our next meeting will be on January 9th, right here at the high school library at 7 p.m. for a public hearing as well as a regular meeting. Thank you. We're just off by 16 minutes. That's not bad. Oh, yeah. we, we made up some time in the there. End there. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Kavanaugh. Thank you. And Ms. Rothamick and Ms. Barson. Good night, Bob.